Stay hungry, stay foolish. Industries face a new reality in which the economics, customers, technologies, and sources of value have shifted from economies of scale to economies of ecosystem engagement. This is what the most successful and explosive growth leaders of today have done, whether it's Amazon or Alibaba, Gilead or Google, Tencent or Tesla. The business logic of the past decades no longer applies. A changed competitive world requires a new strategic direction. Where is value being created and where is it being destroyed in the ecosystem in which you've engaged and what do you do about it? In order to compete successfully in the new paradigm, we need to shift our focus from how to improve our products and services to what it is customers want to do and how our products and services could help them do that. Today's show will share specific lessons and insights for every sized organization to make sense of the changed competitive environment, including what is your ecosystem, who comprises it, and what is driving the shifts in value. How instead of pushing products do you own a problem, meet a specific customer need, and tackle specific friction? Most importantly, how do you execute? Today's guest has held a variety of leadership positions, including CEO of Imaginatic, where he received the European CEO Award in 2016. He has been leader of IBM's strategy and transformation business in the Middle East and Africa, and senior vice president of KPMG Consulting. But today's focus is his truly excellent book, Topple, The End of Firm-Based Strategy and the Rise of New Business Models for Explosive Growth. Welcome, Dr. Ralph Welburn, PhD. Hey, hi. Happy to be here. That was a serious mouthful, man. (laughs) (laughs) That that was. (laughs) That's all from me. We've no more time now after that intro. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. I, I thought a brilliant way, Ralph, to start the show would be your excellent context setter, which is the idea of the Red Queen analogy. Yeah, so something I, I get asked a lot is what's going on and why now? And th- so the Red Queen is a character that I'm sure many of us know through The Looking Glass and, and Alice in Wonderland. She's a character who runs faster and faster, but stays in the same place. And I find it really interesting is that she's an incredibly apt analogy for many businesses throughout the world. And and, and actually, in my experience, it doesn't matter their size, their geography, or what they do. A lot of people run faster and faster, but stay in the same competitive place. So I've always been struck with, why is that? What's going on? And it, you boil it down to many, many, many businesses are optimized for a world that no longer exists. And forget the talking about the words, just look at the data. And we see that the topple rate, the rate at which organizations fall from their competitive position is accelerating. So for example, off the Fortune 500 and the G2000, 80% of the companies that were on The Fortune 500 20 years ago are no longer there. Remember, the General Electric just fell off of the S&P six weeks ago. I mean, this is just friggin' astounding what's going on. And that topple rate is accelerating in every industry. So that's data point one. Data point two, 12% of companies capture 85% of economic profit in just about every industry. Think about that. Leaving the, the, the Think about that number. 12% capture 85% of economic profit. And that concentration rate is, is, is getting greater and greater, which means that the majority of firms are fighting over table scraps. So just take these numbers and then go back to this, wow, something, something is definitely going on. And more and more companies are feeling this pressure. And again, we see this because top of rate is accelerating the economic Profit numbers are concentrating. And as more and more companies are feeling this, they're saying, oh, my gosh, I've got to do something. Doing more of what I currently do is not enough. They're running the Red Queen race. And the Red Queen race basically is people look at the new shiny object in front of them. And whether that shiny object is IoT, Internet of Things, or whether it's AI, or whether it's innovation, or whether it's digital transformation, 
is the big is a big sexy object of today. And there are a lot of big new shiny objects out out there today. But here's a question I always have. If many organizations, if most organizations are following, chasing the new shiny object in similar ways, then rationally, what's going to be different in a few years? What's, where are you going to be compared to your, your peers? Other than you're going to have burned an awful lot of capital, an awful lot of people out in that process. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. So the question becomes, what do I need to do? And that was the motivation writing this book. I was amazed at how prevalent the Red Queen race was, and there had to be something new, and there is. You've written other books as well, and I'm just going to share the links to them afterwards, but you didn't feel you were going to write another book. You felt the books were done, but then you saw this increasing need. You saw the topple rate. You saw people still on that Red Queen treadmill, still running that race over and over, and you felt that you had to interject somehow. Oh, yeah. I had no interest. Zero interest. I had. I'm more than busy in my in my in my day jobs, and yet, exactly as you mentioned, uh, I was working with with a CEO of a of a large company and a, a large healthcare company, and and after working with him for a short time, he said, "You know, I'm actually running the Red Queen race, and and I've got to do something different." And we worked with him, and and did some amazing work about redefining the question. I know we'll get into that in more in more detail. Because he was saying, I've got to do something different. There's got to, there have to be new models out there. How do I take advantage and learn the lessons of explosive growth companies? That was his phrase. I don't want to be running the Red Queen race. What do I do? After we worked on that, he said, Ralph, you have to write the book. You just have to do that. And so that was the motivation. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks a lot. Dylan. Thank you for me as well. I absolutely loved it because it's actually like a field book. It's a reference book. And I know it's available on Kindle as well. But this is a book, I have a beautiful hard copy, and I know I'll be referring to it time and time again because it sparked so many ideas for blogs and for other shows for me. So it really was valuable for me that way. But you mentioned there the new lens, you mentioned new questions. And there's a great Wayne Dyer quote, which is change what you see and what you see changes. And it really resonated with me as I read this, because you talk about a new lens, which highlights new objects we didn't see before. And business ecosystems can provide such a lens. And let's dive into that piece because the ecosystem piece is something that people hear. It's a jargony term that they hear bandied around. And I'd love to get your simplified version that you talk about in the book. Yeah, maybe what I could do is I'll mention a definition and then let's talk to examples because that's really important. It's funny because a number of years ago, five years ago or so, maybe even more than that, I used to work with the Department of of defense, and we would tackle. We worked on what are known as wicked problems. Wicked problems. Of ter- it's a, a term that simply means really, really, really hard problems that no one organization can deal with on their own. And and so our what we were focused on is is how do you fight a network of bad guys with a network of good guys? And and so I started to get really sensitive to the issue of. What are the different organizational forms people can take to tackle really hard problems? And again, five years ago or so, when when I was back in the commercial space, I noticed that there were these new models out there. And at that time, business ecosystem was not used. It was a it, it was a brand spanking term. Today, you're right; it's absolutely become jargon. And there are two ways of looking at it. And then I'll we'll dig into it. One, a lot of people use ecosystems as a marketing, as a, as a jargony word, which simply means a lot of partnerships. Get more people, get more people to partner. That is absolutely not what I'm talking about. At the other end of the continuum here of a definitions is the orchestration of capabilities from different firms to solve a really hard problem. Let me give an example. So I cite an example, and, and, and again, I was privileged to work with an extraordinary entrepreneur in, I'll use a, an example from Africa, and the business problem that we wanted to, that he wanted to tackle was the one where a, a father was unable to, a parent was unable to buy food for their family, say it was a Tuesday, until Friday. They didn't have money to do so. So the question became, how do we help this family get food to feed the, to, to, to feed the kids? And a typical response to this that a bank would typically do, of course, is they would look at the value chain 
They would take cost out of each different steps of that value chain, repackage up this micro loan in a, in a low cost manner and sell it. Very logical approach to take. What Julian did instead was said, well, wait a minute. There are, there are lessons from other explosive growth companies around the world. Let's do that. Let's figure out what are the essential capabilities needed to buy food for my family? Well, I need. what do you need? You need to have insight in terms of what stores you could go to. You needed to have a form of exchange that you could take. Now, you don't have money. Remember, you don't have money here. But you needed a form of exchange to buy the goods you needed or to get the goods you needed. Well, what are the forms of exchange? Well, mobile minutes. There's 1.2 phones per capita in Africa. So we said, all right, mobile minutes are on phones. Maybe we could use those as a forms of exchange. Now, who owns mobile minutes? Julian didn't. He's an entrepreneur. He's starting up. The, teleco the telcos do. And so he said, ah, so we need to figure out how we can get access to the network data and to the mobile minute that can be used as, as mechanism of exchange to buy food, which required us to go to some of the largest telcos in Africa. They were more than happy to say, huh, the problem that we have as a telco is getting more data through our pipes because we're, we don't make money. We're not making enough money on, on the data. Most of our money is through the voice lines, and that's clearly not a winning business. If you can help us drive more money through our pipes, which will make us more money, a win-win for me, and it's a win-win for you, of course we can figure out how to do that. So what Julian did was orchestrate capabilities from different organizations, insight in terms of mobile minutes, um, access to what stores to go to, and so on. And he provided that interface and the orchestration of capabilities from different actors in service of that problem. At the end of six months, while the bank's approach to solving this problem was 1,500 loans a week, Julian was driving 1,500 a day. And that simply continued to grow. So a business ecosystem, use, the reason I picked on that example is to give an example of what one actually looks like is the orchestration of capabilities from different partners. Julian's case, it was supply chain distributors and it was also telco providers orchestrating those capabilities to solve a very specific problem, namely how to get food for my family. And it's interesting. You can look at that. But it, these are, this, this underlying model is the same for all ecosystem models. Uber is the same thing. Uber doesn't own the assets. Uber is orchestrating the capabilities from people who provide cars figuring out how to pay very easily, getting access from satellite data to make it very, very simple for you to, to know exactly where your car is. Uber doesn't own any of those assets. Uber orchestrates those assets from different partners, different parties in order to deliver value. This model of orchestration critical capabilities is the DNA underlying explosive growth models, no matter who they are or what they happen to be. That is a fundamental difference. You know, we could talk a little bit later about about what lessons to learn and what drove it and so on. But that's simple. That's so. Uh, so the definition of a business ecosystem, in my from my mind, is crisp. The orchestration of critical capabilities from different parties to solve a particular problem. Isn't this where we see the kind of confusion by business leaders of the old paradigm that? They ha historically new growth has come from tackling customer friction or bringing new customers onto a field in in new ways. But this new world is is becoming like you say, like like when you said orchestration of, of ecosystems, I literally thought of the new leaders being like chess players with the pieces all being different companies or different partners, and they their game is actually to put them in the right places at the right time and get them speaking a common language. Yes, absolutely. And he, look, here's another thing we're seeing, and I'll, and I'll play off of, of what you just asked there as well, is we are now competing in a world without sectors, right? Industry borders are fundamentally blurring. And people say, oh, that's a marketing term. Well, that sounds like a, a bunch of buzzwords. But think about this. A couple of years ago, Detroit every year has the annual automobile global conference. And at that conference, every CEO 
of, of the large automobile companies said, hey, we are no longer automobile companies. We are mobility companies. And, and I remember, we may all remember that. And I remember there, were, there was a lot of giggling at that. Oh, that, that sounds pretty funny. But it was actually great insight where they recognized that the capabilities that they had to date were not going to be the capabilities that they were going to need in the future. That this whole concept of mobility was going to be absolutely critical to for people to engage and and and, and with and for them to continue to be relevant and make money. And so this this blurring of boundaries is exactly the mindset we have to think. And what an ecosystem does, back to a comment you made before, is it shifts how you think about a problem. The, so it's like the Hubble telescope. Once we put the, helico- the, hub- the Hubble telescope in space, we could see, A, we could see different things, or B, we could see the same things, but in different ways. And once you start looking at this problem from an ecosystem point of view, the various chess pieces on a board, as you mentioned, you can't go back. I often say that a changed competitive environment requires a new strategic question. And the question is no longer, how do I sell more of what I've currently got? But it's where is value being created and destroyed in my ecosystem? And what am I going to do about it? What, 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 where am I going to plant my flag on the type of customer friction or real significant need that exists, recognizing that solving that problem is going to entail much more and simply leveraging the products and services that I currently have. It's going to require, if we really look at from a, from an outside in, a customer friction or market friction point of view, it's going to require products and services from other actors, from other industries. Take Uber, take Amazon, take, take Julian. All of those required capabilities and product services from others. And the explosive value came from, number one, orchestrating them, and number two, re- rethinking, reimagining how any one firm can snap into and play within that ecosystem. And that's why, and this, you know, I get, I get asked this question a lot. Wow, well, this sounds like it's only relevant for large companies. Absolutely not. <laughs> this, is, this is as applicable for the smallest company. Julian, for goodness sakes, was an entrepreneur starting. But even for small companies that have, have their existing products and services, rethinking of what's the fundamental problem and then saying, how do I snap into this ecosystem? There's extraordinary power in that. And that's what we're seeing over and over again. I love what you said there about the questions, because if you're going to see new things, you've got to ask new strategic questions. And you say, ask a different question, get a different answer. I'd love to talk about some of those questions to ground it for people listening to the show. Because imagine somebody listens to this show and totally changes their business. That would be fantastic. So you talk initially about the unit of focus needs to change, for example. Here's what I mean by that. Let's take a, a very specific uh, example of a relatively uh, a mid-sized company. And they look at their world from the point of view of, I make specialty fibers. I'm the, and, and I use my fibers to wrap insulation, nuclear power plants, uh, um, so, so coolants, uh, cooling towers within them, and so on. That's what I do. I, and I'm really good at it. And I'm a market leader in this type of space. That's what I do. And so they define their competitive world in terms of the products that they happen to deliver at that time. Because frankly, all companies are successful. They've been very successful to date. Otherwise, they wouldn't still be in business. But the challenge comes to what you've been, you're optimized for a world that no longer exists. So these guys, even though they were market leaders, were saying, all right, I'm very, very good at this. At this, My unit of focus is my company, my set of products that I benchmark again. However, as the market shifts, and you start to look at it, well, where's value being created and destroyed in my ecosystem? Then, and then all of a sudden you start to say, huh, there is a new problem I need to go tackle. And if I figure out how to tackle that, number one, instead of simply looking at my, my strategy, my execution plans in terms of how do I make variants of my, my insulation or how do I do a little adjacent in terms of, 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 again, incremental product, and maybe I wrap some services around it. Maybe that's my new strategy to go forward. You start to say, huh, let's say, what are all the capabilities necessary to tackle that problem? And then you look at your portfolio. So back to this particular company of the specialty fibers, 
extraordinarily market break. So let me step back for a second. Explosive growth historically and across every industry has come from market friction. So customer friction, market breakdown or non-consumption. People just weren't engaged. So this company recognized there was an extraordinary market breakdown in terms of safety. The whole issue of regulatory, we're shifting about how are we looking at at the safety issues in nuclear power plants, in cars, for goodness sakes, is we're moving to connected cars or large turbines or whatever else. The issue was safety. All the regulations were around the world were shifting. How do you make sense of that? Simply saying, hey, I'm the specialty fiber guy, they could they could they could continue to grow their market, sure. But as we said, hey, there are some extraordinarily shifts happening in the world around safety. If we could figure out what are some of the, the I call it the new 20%, the new 20% of capabilities critical to tackle this big market friction area and breakdown issue around safety in industrial products. What could I do? How could I play in that? And, and you could see that building specialty fibers is a small subset of the whole issue of Safe, of safety broadly defined within industrial products. But as we define, redefine, what are the core elements that make up safety within industrial products? What are the different type of services, the whole different type of products that exist of which I currently only deliver a small set, but other folks deliver other type of products? And then I figure out, huh, which one of these, what role do I want to play within the industrial safety ecosystem what are the ones that that are that make sense for me? What data can I create from that? What partnerships can I create? What new capabilities can I develop? What new products can I develop? How do I actually start moving, shaping that ecosystem of different type of parties around capturing the value around safety within industry? And that's what these guys did. And as a result, they started driving two and a half times the 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 industry average growth. So that's an example of planting a flag around a really hard problem, number one. And then number two, saying, what are the core capabilities necessary to protect that flag or to own that hill? And then number three is, is what are the products and services that we currently have that support that? And then number four, what are the other ones out there necessary? And what do I do about that? Do I partner? Do I build? What do I do about that? Those are the pragmatic steps that we're seeing over and over again, irrespective of the of the explosive growth company. There's a key piece now. So moving into, you've identified a, an ecosystem of partners or interactions that you want to go after. And you bring up this really, really poignant question, which is, I'm sure for people listening who work in transformation, they've heard it time and time again, or CEOs have heard it. We have a lot of people, people are CEOs who listen to the show. And there's a question that you raise here. And it's a CEO, Mark, you call him in the book. He gets asked by his investors, when will we see the ROI of the investments in the innovation? And I'm sure people have heard that time and time again. And it's a question that's very, very difficult to answer, which raises the idea of a common currency that you talk about. And I'd love to share that concept. There's often a gap between what organizations and leaders want to do <laughs> and what actually gets done, that execution gap. And actually, that was the focus of, of the second book, because that was something we saw over and over and over again is, why is there this gap? What, what, how do we make sense of this gap? How do we bridge this gap? And w the specific example with Mark was the following, and then I'll go, I'll play with the gap a little bit more. His question was, I've got a big bet portfolio of a very significant amount of money. And his question was, well, look, I need to make sure my, my portfolio is pointed in the right direction. I need to get an ROI with it. And our comment to him was, well, fine question. It's the wrong question to ask. Because for, for two reasons. Number one is we can't know the future. We can certainly predict it. We can certainly under, build scenario capabilities around which to help us adapt to whatever comes to pass. But we can't know. But what we can do is recognize that whatever future we're going to engage in is going to involve different stakeholders. By definition, a large bet is going to involve different type of, of stakeholders. Now, here's where it gets interesting. 
there are external stakeholders and internal stakeholders. And I'll never forget, there was a, the, the uh, senior exec on, on the team used to say, look, when the executive team gets together, we talk about this big bet and what we're going to do. And, and, and I'm in charge of sustainability. That's my, that's my portfolio. So I need to look at things from that point of view. But ultimately, when we make decisions, it always comes down to ROI. And I have no voice at this executive table. How can I have a voice? And what not, now not having a voice, it, it means that the, the decision-making process is fundamentally going to be thin and brittle. And that's where this concept of currency comes in. A currency is a unit of value, different types of value that motivates the behavior of different folks. So the CFO lens that they often use is going to be money in the door as quickly as possible. If I'm in charge of sustainable sustainability and carbon footprint, my value, the thing that motivates me that, that around which I organize my business is carbon footprint. So my currency is carbon footprint. Someone else who's in charge of uh, will be in charge of brand equity. Someone else will be in charge of whatever else. Each of those types of value are equally important to folks. So the question becomes, how do you build a language that people who are motivated by different types of value can be organized to execute effectively on the overall strategic objectives that you happen to have? And this concept of currency and getting clear on what are, sometimes in the second book, I call the semantic disconnect of people. Because in the semantic disconnect, people may even use the same term but mean very different things by them. Who's listening to this has not had that experience. So again, this concept of currency helps bridge this ex- bridge this execution gap by giving a voice and a rigorous method by which decisions can be made by understanding what the different currencies are, what motivates. So, so back to the example of the portfolio, we created a modeling capability, quick modeling capability that allowed us to play what if games. We can't know the future. But, but what happens if oil prices rise? What happens if regulations in Europe change dramatically? What happens if whatever else? And depending upon those big external variables change, we could take a look at the portfolio and then we could add a layer on it. Well, what happens if what really motivates us today or what we think is really important is we add carbon footprint into our considerations? What happens if we say 80%, we weight our, our analysis by saying, let's look at this from 75% driven by ROI return within the next couple of years, 25% by carbon footprint. How would that look differently if it was 50 and 50 and so on? So the ability to create, to understand what currencies are becomes an extraordinarily powerful way to give voice to folks who are motivated by different types of value. And that's critical. Now, let's take it. One other quick example. When you're dealing with a really, really hard problem, like healthcare, for example. By definition, healthcare is is involves different types of stakeholders who are motivated by different things. Some by profit, some by nonprofit, some by patient outcomes, some by whatever else it happens to be. To orchestrate people from these very very different perspectives requires number one, taking an ecosystem point of view. Number two, creating what I call these currency maps, so that people can understand if. How is it that that I'm going to get what I need as well? And if I can, if if we can show them that they're going to get what they need, then that's how you start mobilizing the ecosystem in service to what you want to do. And I have a number of examples throughout the book on using healthcare, for example, is how do you orchestrate those type of behaviors of different stakeholders? Yeah, and it really the currency really made a lot of sense to me because even divisions within the company. So take, for example, media. So you have traditional media in a newspaper, and then you have the digital team. And the digital team is seen to be cannibalizing the traditional team. And to find a common apples for apples value is very, very difficult. And I love the example you give, like you talk about CSR, for example, which is seen as this squishy initiative that's not profit driving. And then you talk about AMR, so antimicrobial resistance. And that's a huge problem in the world, which means that you have to bring together private and public enterprise and government sectors, for example, and get them collaborating, which is something I know private companies particularly 
dislike. But you talk about that that can be done by using the currency map. Yes, absolutely. And again, this is one of the things that I find particularly exciting about these new business models. Uh, they can tackle these very, very hard problems that previously we couldn't before because they're designed to orchestrate capabilities from different type of actors who are motivated by different types of value or currencies to tackle a problem. Here's a, so there's a, a relatively recent example and within the, just the past eight weeks is around healthcare. Healthcare, as we all know, is an incredibly hard problem to tackle. In, in, for in many, many places, it's more like sick care. You, you come in and your, your symptoms are dealt with and then you're kicked out the door. And the next time you're sick, you come back. And that's the process. It's very transactional, very sick care oriented. And we all know the challenges of that. But we also know the business model that gave rise to that. So eight weeks ago or so, there was a massive announcement by JP Morgan by Berkshire Hathaways, and by Amazon. And here are three incredibly large companies, very, very different industries. But remember, go back to this issue of industry borders are blurring. And they said, together, we are going to tackle healthcare and wellness in a fundamentally different way than has been done before. And so think about that. That is what they're doing is inherently an ecosystem-centric model Similar to the examples we were talking about before, whether we were talking about the, the, the healthcare one, whether we were talking about the, the Africa example or, or even Uber uh, or Amazon, they're saying we have capabilities, a set of critical capabilities. Remember, let's go back. to We have to explore this concept with the new 20 percent. But we have critical capabilities that each of us has. None of us alone can tackle this concept of wellness. But together, because we each have a different set of capabilities, let's figure out how we're going to plant our flag around the concept of wellness, not sick care, but healthcare and wellness, and see what we can do fundamentally different than has been done today. It's an incredibly interesting experiment to watch over, over the next couple of years. But this is the type of really hard problem that we can start solving now that meets both, I call it, opportunity to create both greater economic value and societal benefit. We haven't had that before. We now do. And so it's an exciting time from that point of view. I'd love to come back to something, Ralph, that's it's a fundamental lesson that you teach in the book, which is that there's a new 20% in the world, that there's a new 20% in business. And it's a term a lot of people may not have heard of. So I'd love if you explained the old and then the new. Yeah, this is one of the incredibly pragmatic lessons that people can start using right away. I appreciate that going through the exercise of what flag we plant, what's a new strategic question, what does it mean? I can appreciate that that might require some thinking through or talking with folks uh, around new 20% and you can start doing tomorrow. So here, here, here it is. Every organization has been very, very successful up to date, clearly. What we've seen is that approximately 20% of capabilities has always driven approximately 70% of the economic value that you produce. It just doesn't matter. That's just that's just what we're seeing. So again, back in a world where where businesses are optimized for a world that no longer exists, as the world shifts, the twenty percent that made you successful up to date logically will not be the same as the twenty percent you're going to need tomorrow. Right? It's just a logic thing. So, got it. Those are the words. Let me give an example to make it very tangible. I was working with an insurance company here in the states. At that time, and we we had the executive team in, and we were going through this concept of the new twenty percent, and what what might be the new twenty percent of tomorrow, and they were wrestling with it, and then all of a sudden, the head of strategy stood up from his from 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 the table, started walking around. He said, "I get it, I get it." He said, "I'm an insurance company, and we're an insurance company. Insurance company is all mobilized around pricing risk." It's all around protecting our book of risk. So our 20%, the actuarial sciences, the policies we create, procedures we make, and they're about, he says, yeah, that sounds about right. About 20% of our capabilities drive the majority of the value, and that value is around pricing that risk. What? And then he asked, he said, what happens in a world where the game, strategic game, is not about pricing risk, but it's about preventing accidents? And the whole room just stopped. 
and 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 it led to an incredibly fascinating discussion about the capabilities necessary to prevent accidents are different from the capabilities necessary to price risk. And the cape, so 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 that led to the question of well, what are those new? What is the twenty percent we've needed today? What's that twenty percent we're going to need to prevent accidents? And and again, this led to the discussion of well, what are going to be some of those new capabilities? Well, we're going to need telemetry data. We're going to need rich data analytics, different type of data analytics, not actuarial data, but a different type of predictive analytics and so on. And so you can see just through that example that the new 20% necessary to capture the, the new value for tomorrow was different. That's why this concept of new 20%, I've, I've, I've had many clients, CEOs down to digital transformation, CMOs, CIOs, whatever, say, what is our 20% today? What needs to be our 20% tomorrow? And let's make sure we're mobilized around that. Fantastic. And you talked then as well about decay rate, because a lot of people won't look at their current set of assets and see them from at their natural decay rate. Everything has a life cycle, but some people are hanging on running the, the Red Queen race with those products or services using them up the whole time. So they're actually running that race and they're totally missing that they have a decay rate and they have to look to new places. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting from that point of view because this concept of decay rate is is also another really it's a, when you again it's back to the back to the idea if you give people value seen as value captured. If you start to to introduce a concept, again, you start to see things in a different way. I remember years and years ago, my wife and I bought a green Subaru. And 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 prior to that, we had never even noticed a Subaru, much less a green Subaru on the road. The minute we drove it off the lot, though, we started to see green Subarus all over the place. <laughs> and it's the same thing with the, the you know new, the concept of the new 20% and the decay rate. The minute you start to say, huh, what are the fundamental assets that drive the value in my company? And then what's the decay rate? And actually, there are very simple ways to get at what that decay rate is. And the minute you, you understand what the slope of that curve happens to be, you can ask yourself different types of strategic questions. A, what's changing the slope of that line? What would it cost to keep the, 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 the curve the same or even to increase that curve? And so you get very, what's the time horizon of that? Does it even make economic sense to extend the time horizon of that? So there are a few questions that fall out of that simple concept. Uh, you know, simple concept with profound implications of the decay rate that you can start looking at. And again, though, when we're talking about agility, the concept of agility is not around, from my point of view, is not around how many agile work teams or scrum teams can we set up. And I, for those who have been involved in digital transformation, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because I've been in many places where they say, well, we're agile. We've got 20 scrum teams. And I go, really? Why? Doing what? In service of what? Hopefully, if they're in service of, of identifying and capturing the new 20%, God bless. That's a beautiful thing to do. But if you're doing stuff just to be doing stuff, they're not aligned that new 20%. That's crazy. And so the, the combination of what's the, what are those core assets? What are its decay rates? Because like you said, you said before, every core asset has a decay rate. Insight into what that slope is and what it takes to change it. And, and making sure that you're changing whatever you do around the new 20%, there you go. Your strategy is really around. It comes down to that. Ask the question, plant the flag, know your decay rate, what's your new 20%, orchestrate your ecosystem. Those are the lessons. Brilliant, Ralph. And you give us the great example of Moss Adams. I thought this one was relevant because this can apply to a smaller firm as well. And their decay rate coming from the world of AI and algorithms. It's for any service organization, it's the you take take you know, pick on Moss Adams is a is a leading accounting um, tax firm on the west coast of the United States. But take some of the global guys, the e, the Ernst and Youngs, the KPMGs, and whatever else. For them to hit the revenue targets that they need, E and Y, I think I remember they needed sixty thousand people within the next eighteen months just to keep going. Or some, for goodness sakes, we don't have enough people on the planet. <laughs> you know, to meet all the growth targets of this. So what do you do? What are going to be the implications of that? 
Um, what will be the implications of different types of technology on your workforce, on different types of workforce? Because there are different different skill sets involved with the workforce, each of which has a different decay rate associated with it. And so getting, starting to, in, instead of panicking around, oh my gosh, I don't know what the impact of technology is going to be. I don't know what to do. I'll do it later. Or running the Red Queen say race and say, give me one of them, them shiny objects around AI or blockchain or predictive or whatever it happens to be. Is it is a great way to lose a lot of money as opposed to being incredibly focused. And and Moss Adams was recognizing we can't keep doing stuff the same way we were doing before. Let's step back and and understand what can we scale, what can't we scale, what is the decay rate of our assets, what will be the new twenty percent that our customers are going to care about, and what do we do about that? That can be applied to smaller firms as well, because so many smaller firms may listen to this show and go, "Oh, that's way above me." But this is coming for big businesses, big and small. Well, see, this is this is one of the things I find incredibly interesting. Is I know a number of the examples. It, so in the book, I tried to make I tried to have a mix of different industries, different geographies, and different sizes, because there is such from, from a so from a from a large company point of view, it is. How do I protect? How do I protect my business to keep staying relevant? For the smaller companies, it's my goodness. The opportunities ahead of me are absolutely enormous because the competitive landscape is shifting from a traditional industry point of view to the blurring. And so, if you figure out that, all right, what flag? Where am I going to plant my flag? What problem am I going to own? By definition, there are going to be so many holes that need to exist to be filled, number one. And number two, to, to see that and say, I don't have to be the big dog on the planet to um, at all. I, what I can do is figure out what capabilities do I have to either orchestrate the overall ecosystem or to play in an area where value is being created and destroyed very differently within some of these supply chains. Small companies, it's incredibly rich opportunity, like the the – specialty fiber company I was talking about before. They're two and a half times the uh, the growth rate of anybody else in the industry. They're not a big company by shifting their focus. And I'm, we're seeing that over and over again. And Ralph, you talk about telcos. Telcos have a huge opportunity in the world of ecosystems. Oh, massive. They're absolutely massive. So go back to Every telco on the planet, and I usually am very sensitive about using terms like all and every, but in this case, every telco on the planet has runs the same problem. And the problem is what is known as the JAWS chart. And so, so visualize this. X, Y axis, along the bottom, near relatively flat, is the revenue coming from voice. And then at a, at a much steeper angle on that is the revenue that comes from data. The, the, the space, the, the spatial difference between the low line and the upper line is known as the jaw chart. And what clearly you want to do is close the, the space between those, those, those two lines. You want to close the jaws chart. And every telco is struggling with, how do I do that? The reason that the, the telco in Africa was so interested in working with Julian was because he said, I need people to stuff data through my pipes, not through Facebooks or the other, what are known as the over the top guys. And every telco was struggling with how do I get more data through my pipes as opposed to Facebook and Google and Amazon and everybody else. And that is the challenge. And yet as there is, we're figuring this out and as telcos are getting more embedded into these Julian type ecosystems or these other type of data rich ecosystems, which take the automobile. Right, I'm a mobility company. So, guess what type of partnerships are happening in the automobile industry today? You got it. Ones that are actually pumping a lot more data through these pipes. The the opportunity for these for telcos to make that shift towards the data aggregation as a platform that can be monetized for specific data pro, uh, uh, products to different types of players in many, 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 many different industries is extraordinarily rich. If you can get the executives to say, I, I can't keep running the Red Queen race. I am willing to invest in what this new 20% happens to be. I'm not simply trying to sell more of the current products and services our day. And that's that big mind shift that has to happen for folks to take advantage of the explosive growth curves, or they will keep running the Red Queen race and eventually topple. Some of them 
have seen traditionally Facebook with WhatsApp or Snapchat, the messenger apps as a threat, but the really clever ones don't see it as an us versus them game. They see it as a collaborative approach. Absolutely. And that's absolutely. And, and the beauty of ecosystems is, is this whole issue of, of zero sum winner, you know, I win, you lose. That's going away. That's what's that's what's so exciting about these models. What lesson from explosive? So here, let me make it make it very clear. Lessons of one of the lessons of these new models is I win, we all win. It's not a I win versus you win. So hotels.com is a great example here. And and hotels.com, they take unused hotel inventory and they try to sell it to you. All right, you 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 the customer. They are going to make money only if they're able to do so. So there's a win-win for both Hotel.com, who is orchestrating the inventory between the, the suppliers, the, the hotels who have the rooms, and the buyers, me, the person who wants the hotel's room. So I, as a hotel person, will, will make money if Hotels.com makes money. And if I, the consumer, buy it at a lower price. If Hotels.com is unable to do it, then I, the hotel, lose money. Hotels.com lose money, and I, the consumer, don't get a hotel room. So in this case, everyone wins in this advantage. Now, Leo Tolstoy once had had a wonderful quote around families are similar, but they're similar in different ways. And the same holds for business ecosystem models. Business ecosystems are similar on these principles we all talk about, but they're similar in different ways. And one of the other things that I'm finding incredibly exciting is that there are patterns to these different type of business ecosystems. Not an infinite number, just a short, a handful of them. But one of the concerns that I've got when I, when I talk with folks is, as this business ecosystem becomes a, 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 a marketing buzzword today, number one, marketing buzzword definitions we talked about before, but as, but it's now become confused with, oh, I have to be a platform company. And they're not the same. And there are variants to these models. And, but, it's important as people look at these four lessons of explosive growth company of business ecosystem to recognize there are some differences between them. And that's where it gets exciting because that's where we're going to be competing over the next year. We're not going to be competing firm to firm. We're going to be competing ecosystem versus ecosystem. And so understanding the common DNA elements that make them up and yet how the elements come together in different ways to make them different, to compete differently is what's exciting. And you, you remind us in the book that Mark Andreessen says there's only two types of, types of company, those who bundle and those who unbundle. And this is key to the ecosystem play, to know what to unbundle and what to bundle. You don't have to do one or, or the other in entirety. You just have to know which to do. Exactly. And when to do it and how to do it. That's exactly right. And that's, so, so one of the key questions that, that you know, again, we talked about, a changed competitive environment re- requires a new strategic question. And that new question is where's is value being created and destroyed in the ecosystem. But the corollary to that is where is value being created and destroyed in the value chain in which I'm engaged? And that goes exactly to the heart of when you own a problem and you recognize that there are, say, a couple of industries involved, each of those industries has its own value chain. But as those, as those industry lines get blurred, as an automobile company becomes a mobility company, there's the automobile value chain, mobility value chain. So you've got these, these let's just call them previously two separate value chains going on, which are now starting to bundle and unbundle in different ways to create the new value chain to create value. So that's why the Andreessen's comment, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And the new strategic question, again, is, hey, What's going on? Where is value being created and destroyed? And each step along your value chain, and again, and this is where it gets so exciting to me, is that is that you, we can start to understand what what are the forces, what are the pressures, what are the new twenty percent of capabilities that are impacting these various steps along the value chain, and then I, as a company, say, "Huh, I can't play in all of these, but I can play in this set." And so these frameworks. That we're, we're, that folks are starting to develop it becomes is, this is not just a high level marketing stuff, really pragmatic s- set of, of roadmaps to follow to make sense of, of what's going on and where you can play in it. 
the last piece we might talk about, Ralph, is the idea of customer service and customer experience, because this is becoming a competitive barrier to entry, where in the past it was things like distribution. I believe that many, 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 many people are running the Red Queen race on the whole customer service, customer centricity thing. I think that that a lot of them, I, I believe that there are three generations of customer centricity. And and the, the first generation was about where people say, oh, I have to be more customer centric. Let me look at the processes that I've got and figure out the buzzwords in this this area, this domain are around magic moments and, 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 and secret sauce and whatever else. But what it really is about is finding out where people are frustrated in the process and trying to remove some of those frictions all around delivering you, a, 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 selling you more uh, goods and services of what they already have. And so again, it's it, it take the friction out of a process. So I feel better. I as customer feel better about what I've done. Get me through the the uh, the tree the the phone tree faster, for example. Generation two was all right. That's not enough. What we need to do is really understand what your frustrations are. And some people call it understanding the emotional intent, the emotional dilemmas that people face. We don't need to go into the details here, but but the bottom line, even of this stuff, is I look at the process that a customer engages in, and I'm trying to make the customer feel better about buying and selling, about buying the products and services I have. All good. However, all incremental, all red queen. The third generation where, where, where these new models are telling us is let's not look at it from that point of view. Let's look at it from the point of view of what really is the people don't want to buy, say, a credit card to buy a credit card. They want a credit card in order to do something. They don't buy a car just to have a car. They buy a car to do something. So if we could figure out what it is that they want to do and then figure out what are the friction points they face in that, then we look at the products and services as different. So make it, if I make it real tangible here, is people don't buy – I was working with one company, in an in apparel company, a, a CPG, consumer product good company. And what we were focused on is the traditional approach, the Red Queen strategy was – sell more of our goods by we should open up stores in Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and China because that's where the demographics were. Makes sense. Red Queen strategy. Everyone's going to do that. And you can't win over time on a, on a try to out-execute people strategy. Our question was value being created and destroyed. What are the friction points have? Why are they buying these goods? What what is it? Where do they spend their time and money? And it happened to be that in one of they spent a lot of their people spent time, they were amateur musicians. Now, there are 500 million amateur musicians in the world at a low level. And so we said, well, what are the friction points? What are the pain points people are finding in being an amateur musician? And we found that there were a couple of common things. One of the common things was, you know what? I'm a, And I'll never forget this trumpet player in San Diego. He said, you know what? I would really like to learn more about Ghanaian drumming. And even better, I would love to jam with the Ghanaian drummer. But I don't know where to find that person. So we said, huh. So this idea of how do you find somebody, how do you match them with somebody else to play with? Now, that you would say, well, that's not at all in the domain of an apparel company. But we started to see this pattern that people as musicians wanted to find and match with other people. So we built a digital sound studio on top of that to solve the problem of helping the trumpet player find the Ghanaian drummers and not just find them, but also giving them a digital sound studio to jam together. And so we created a, a services layer, not dissimilar, by the way, to what Amazon did with AWS on their core product back in the day. And what we found then, these this company started to offer these type of services in, to their customers and the pain points they faced. And then they said, hey, we sell apparel, but huh. Maybe there are other type of services we could offer as well. And that's what they did. As a result of that, they are growing three times the industry average growth rate. So this is an example of the third generation of customer centricity is what is it that customers want to do? Forget about your products. What do they use your products for? Figure out what that problem is. And then, and only then, seeing how your products fit in, the other thing that does is gives you insight in terms of what other new services or products you might want to develop or partner with to deliver them. I'd love to finish on this one, 
Ralph, I think this is a key one that so many people miss when they talk about customer segmentation or customer experience is the idea coined by Xerox Park UX developer Donald Norman, which is the idea of affordance. I think that the concept of affordance is one of the most brilliant concepts. It certainly was one of those ones. It was my pers- one of my personal Hubble telescopes. And the idea of affordance is what is it that a product affords you the opportunity to do? In the, so, for example, if you go to a door and there's a doorknob rounded, you know, you just instinctively know, put your hand on that and pull it. If you happen to go to a door with a door handle like that and you try to pull it and it doesn't work, then in Donald Norman's terms, there's a breakdown in that design. That's bad design if it forces you to, which is why on a door, if it's completely flat on the door, that affords you the opportunity to push, whereas a door handle affords you the opportunity to pull. And it's the same thing. A product affords you the opportunity to do something. So figure out what it is that people want to do. And then based on that, redesign your products and services and experience. Last thing to ask you is, there's so much more in the book, by the way. Like we, we didn't even get near covering half of it. And there's a whole end section, section three, that gives you frameworks, how to do this, how to map it out, which is fantastic. And I'd love to finish with what your call to action, because this is in your bones. You've been doing this for such a long time. You genuinely want people to adapt to the new way and get away from the Red Queen race. What's your call to action for business owners and business leaders out there? Yeah. So so a couple of quick things. One is I passionately believe we live in a change competitive landscape and, and a change one requires a new strategic question. Number one, ask the new question. Number two, brutally pragmatic, wrestle through what is your existing 20%, what is your new 20%. And number three, I'm more than happy to talk. I help firms around the world on this topic. You can reach out to me at ralph.wellborn at gmail.com go to clearprism.com. Author of Topple, The End of Firm-Based Strategy and Rise of New Models for Explosive Growth, Dr. Ralph Wellburn, PhD. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you much. Bye.